First of all, I just want to acknowledge the beauty of this room. <clears throat> I see the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, tobacco ties up there. It's very symbolic. And that's all part of our circle. And those colors, white, black, and red, are my spirit colors. And also, I have to acknowledge these other items that are hanging up there. They too have ears and that are listening. And they're making sure, they're making sure that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, they're, they're uh, picking up all the information that's being set up here. But my name is Caroline Dagnault. I'm from Fishing Lake, First Nation in Saskatchewan. And the best way I describe where that is, when I'm asked where about it is, is anywhere between Humboldt and Yorkton. That's where I'm at. <laughs> I'm uh, one one hour away from from each uh, from each town, and again, I'm very honored to be up here to talk about diabetes. I'm a grandmother. I'm a great grandmother. I have four great grandchildren, all girls. And I have eight grandchildren, four boys, four girls. And I have a set of twins of my own, a boy and a girl. <clears throat> and I call them my adult children because they're 46 years old. <clears throat> but I'm always proud to, to mention that when I, when I introduce myself. <clears throat> I'm Soto. I speak my language very fluently, uh, which I never lost. I'm a product of a uh, residential school. Both my mom and dad were in residential school. But my dad was only in there for a few days until he ran away and never went back. But my mom was in there from the age of five till she was 16. <clears throat> and when her and dad got married, they had 16 children, very large family. And a majority of us also attended <clears throat> the residential school. I was six years old when I was uh, when I was sent to to this school. There was a bus that came to our community, and I was ever so excited because I'm going for a bus ride. But little did I know that I wasn't going to be back for a while. <clears throat> And when we got to our destination, these, uh, these people came about, come to meet the, uh, the bus on the side of the building. And they had uh, very strange uh, <clears throat> outfits. And they were, uh, they, they looked very stern, like the way they were standing, and like and there was something about them I really didn't, I wasn't sure of already. <clears throat> but little did I know that that was going to be the, it was going to be a start of a very, a very rough journey for two years. I think the most, the first derogatory thing that I heard that very night as we were being put through the showers and being scrubbed down and they were putting 
this white powder stuff in our hair. And there was an assembly of sisters sitting. One was applying this white stuff. One was sitting there with the scissors that was ready to, to, uh, to do the hair cutting. And I didn't know what to make of that. But because my mom spoke very good English, she also taught us that, ling that, that language. So I understood some of the things that these, these nuns were saying. And the first derogatory thing I heard was, they're such dirty little Indians, look at that. They're just full of dirt, full of dirt. And I wasn't right. <clears throat> I knew that wasn't right. So that was only the beginning of that era. Um, I think the third night I was there, I started getting lonely. I wanted to go home. So I started crying, and the nun came to me and asked me, why are you crying? And I told her in Soto, I want to go home. And she yanked me by my arm, very rough, and told me, don't, don't, you do not talk like that in here. God is going to punish you for talking like that. And I really didn't understand what she, she meant until later. She meant she didn't, I'm not supposed to speak my language, was what she didn't want me to do. So in a very short time, I become, I came to learn about a punishing God. God's going to punish you if you don't do this, if you don't do that. God's going to punish you because you're Indian. So I, you know what, I carried that for many, many years because that kind of information brought my self-esteem very low where it stayed a very long time. And as life went on, <clears throat> I realized because of the trauma that I experienced at such an early age, my, my life was already being poisoned mentally, emotionally, physically and spiritually. And I come to have a very strong belief in that. Because my dad was very traditional. He had a lot of beliefs that he passed on to a lot of us in a family, talking to us, explaining to us about certain things. <clears throat> And two of the things that he always made sure that he told us to use and be part of our lives is being kind. Be not sick. To say you are sick, be lovable. Be kind to the person next to you. Love the person next to you. Don't go around trying to be better than anybody else. Gego papa it's a cake. Gego papa mami kwan and this cake. Don't go around bragging about yourself because you have. <coughs> you don't need to go there. You don't need to do that. 
I used to hear him telling my older brothers and sisters that when they were going somewhere. And another thing that was very important to him was he spoke to us in Soto all the time. What every little thing he told us was in Soto. Also another thing that was very important to him for us to know was kinship, how we related to each other, our relatives. And I learned that about that and I carry that a very long ways to this day when I hear that term, all my relations. That's where that comes from. That teaching comes from that. As time went on, <clears throat> I, uh, I became, I turned to alcohol at a very early age because I couldn't handle I couldn't handle what I was going to show the different things that were happening in my life. I, when I became a parent, I was 19, when I became a parent, I wasn't ready to be a parent because I did all of that already, helping my mom with my siblings. I did a lot of parenting there, I did a lot of babysitting, I had to do a lot of the, the chores that had to be done when mom and dad were away working. So when I became pregnant with my first child, I wasn't ready for that. I just wasn't ready for that. And I did have, I did have a daughter, and I still wasn't ready to, to take that responsibility and to make a commitment to look after that child. So my mother and my dad and my parents brought my daughter up for me. And she left home when she was 19, going on 20. She left mom and dad. And in between that time, we had some, we used to have some interaction. But she was also, she got into, the, into a, a rebellious stage. And she wanted answers. Why did you not bring me up, Mom? So at that time, I had to come up with some very, some very good answers. But I had to be honest with her that I just wasn't ready to be a parent. As she got older, she became a parent herself. She had a little girl. She was in a very good relationship. And then her relationship broke down. After her relationship broke down, she got into drinking, something that she didn't normally do. <clears throat> so many times I had to step into to try and to try and help her. And I lost that daughter three years ago to alcohol and drugs in Edmonton. And I had to do redemption. I had to do I had to do a lot of soul searching. I had to go through a lot of pain <clears throat> and grief and to accept what had, had just happened. 
I was in denial. Blame myself, of course. But the good thing about that was about three years before she died, her and I became, became very close. We began to visit each other, talk about stuff. And she was a very humorous person. So I always need to mention that and also to remind myself that when we're given children, these are gifts that we're given. And we have to respect and look, look after those gifts. When they're not looked after, those gifts can be taken. And that's the way I understand that concept. Today, I'm 68 years old. I'm retired. I've done social work for 40 years. I helped a lot of people in my past. But also, there's always we all have our own destinies. 2015, I got pneumonia. And I was hospitalized for seven weeks. I just about, I just about died. I did go somewhere, but was sent back. And when I came out, I was out for about six, seven days. Didn't know what was happening. But when I came to, I, uh, I had been diagnosed with diabetes in 2000, year 2000. In 2004, I had a mild stroke. It didn't affect me in any way. It affected my speech a bit, but I regained that again. In 2005, I had a heart attack, and I had an angioplasty done, where they put one stent into the artery that was blocking. So when I had pneumonia, as I was sick for those six days, I, uh, my kidneys were failing very fast. So my son had to sign a consent for them to put me on dialysis. And I've been on dialysis since. I go for hemo twice a week for four hours each time. And I, I wouldn't wish that, that upon anybody. It's not, it's not, it's not good. Sometimes I feel good, other times I feel awful. And a lot of these things that I begin to learn about diabetes as time went on, what are some of the implications that can happen? And what's going to happen to me? It's a very scary journey. Because the diabetes is always going to be there. My kidneys are not doing the work that they should be doing anymore. So it's the, the hemodialysis that's doing that work now. And it's very challenging. Um, 
and there's a lot of other things that can that can happen but I'm also a very I've always been a very stubborn person it may not look like it but um, I do get very stubborn when it comes to uh, different different things that I find out when I start thinking about the implications the complications of what what could happen to me today tomorrow but I always think I'm not gonna let that that sickness that disease define who I am I'm still gonna go I'm still going to try and do whatever I can. If I can help one person, that's good enough for me. But it's, it's the work that has to be done. And I'm very, uh, when it comes to doing things, I look at it as giving back because Obviously, the great one up there wasn't ready for me, so I still have a purpose. <clears throat> I still have a purpose on earth, and I firmly believe that purpose is to help that next individual to me that's suffering from diabetes. We may not come up with a cure, but it can be prevented. With a lot of education, teachings, workshops, to educate people, especially our young people. Today, Juvenile diabetes is beginning to be very rampant. A lot of our young people are starting to get that. I have a 14-year-old granddaughter that's been diagnosed with diabetes, and she takes insulin. So when I, when I when I won't let this disease def define me, I can get very stubborn, not to a point where I'm not going to take my medication. I won't go there. I still take my medication <clears throat> as faithfully as I can because I know I have to live two parts of the, two parts of the world my traditional ways and then the Western ways because with the Western way they have the medicines that they that they have that we need to put in our bodies to to help deal with this disease that's happening and we also have the traditional medicines that are also just as potent as the Western uh, medicines. So I got to live both worlds. As long as I have that understanding of where things are really coming from, from my perspective, I can see a lot of my people dying from diabetes. I see a lot of that happening already today. A lot of people you see with amputations, legs, limbs that have been amputated because of diabetes. And to be proactive and to come together and work as one, we all have a common goal in all our communities to to serve our people, to help our people, to educate our people, to educate those little ones that are just starting to grow, 
to start making sure that they that they eat they eat good they eat right today it's very difficult to do that a lot of single single mothers back home have struggle with that and want to they give their little ones a bag of chips and a bottle of pop that's lunch and that is so not good so i i like sharing my story i feel if I don't have the answers to everything, then my, my story can help at least one person. That's a lot. And I know there's a lot of diabetics all over the country, especially in our communities. My goal is I'm hoping that we can begin to start dealing with government to start pursuing the possibility of and there is such a possibility to begin to start putting hemodialysis machines in our health centers because i know a lot of our communities have beautiful health centers we have a very beautiful health center. I, uh, I was on council for one term a few years back, and that was one of the things that I had, had wanted to get going. I used to meet with the health professional people the health portfolio holder and I used to bring that matter up because I told them we're going to need that pretty soon because of the way things are going. We're going to need hemodialysis machines of our own so that we can, if we want to be self-sufficient, that's one place that we can start instead of the people having to travel an hour, two hours, to go and get dialyzed. Some go three times a week. I go twice a week. But I have a four hour run each time. I, uh, one of the other things too that I, that I question a lot is how many of our indigenous people have had kidney transplants? I think the first couple of years that I was on hemo, they put me on the list for a kidney transplant. So they started doing all kinds of tests. Every week they had me going to Saskatoon to go and get tests done. And then the very last test I had to do was to go and see a cardiologist. And when I went and seen that cardiologist, he's the one that blew everything away because of the stent that I had in my heart and the heart attack I had. I had had in 2005 was a risk that I wouldn't, my heart wouldn't, wouldn't take the surgery. So they took me off the list with no questions asked, wrote me a letter and told me, informed me that I was no longer on that, that list, but that was okay. Because I come to believe also that sometimes there's a purpose for everything. If it isn't meant for me to have that transplant, then it's not going to happen. So that's the way I looked at that. And I like, I like talking about 
diabetes. I think the first time that I was diagnosed, I didn't want anybody to know that. I didn't want anybody to know, to say I'm diabetic. I didn't want it. I didn't want to go there. I was in denial for a very long time. I think it had to take something drastic, like a heart attack or this pneumonia thing that I had, for me to come out of that shell and start saying, hey, I need to talk about this. So that's what I've been doing ever since. And I like telling my story. Sometimes it begins to sound like a broken record, but you know, anytime we want to learn about something, we have to hear something over and over again. And I've come to believe that in a very long, a long time ago. I had elders, Cree elders, that helped me on my journey. And those are some of the things that he taught me. So I have a lot of respect for the Cree people. Also, my late husband was a Cree. He was Métis. He spoke Fluent Cree. He also spoke Métis. And um, so I, I can always say I'm very lucky to have that. And today I speak to my grandchildren in Soto, speak to them in Cree. My granddaughter asked me one day, what am I supposed to learn how to speak then, Grandma, Soto or Cree? That's entirely up to you. I told her, whatever you feel, you feel comfortable with. So I speak mostly Soto at home. And that's what they're learning. I have a four-year-old little grandson that's learning the Soto language very fast because he's very uh, he's very smart, smart little boy. But uh, <clears throat> I had dialysis Monday, and I'm going home Saturday. I'll have dialysis Monday again, so by then I'm really going to need it. Because uh, when I start um, getting out of breath, I, uh, I have to start watching my fluid intake. I can only, I can only drink a little bit of water or tea. And it just seems like when it's that time, tea tastes so good that I want to drink so much of it, and I know I can't. But I had that some tea at supper there, and oh, I just tasted ever so good. Went well with the bannock and the soup. But I also want to thank the cooks for cooking a very delicious supper tonight. And I want to thank you all for sitting here, listening to our stories. And I'm very honored again to meet with